All right. So we have well, there's the Rushevsky Mises we're going to look at, and also we have Rubenstein's Immortal Game. Now there's the famous position. It's a puzzle that you may know, but it's important to know the context as well. How do you actually get there? So we have Rubenstein with black, Rot, I'm butchering it, Rot Louis, Rot Louis with white. So this was in 1907. All Russian masters. Okay. So D4, D5. Now we're going to see a lot, we're going to see symmetry, basically dead symmetry. How do you make something? Else? Well, we're going to notice the development rate. How we get there and how we exploit that despite symmetry. Okay. So we have basically this is the setup that black would get into Tarash, although white would have c4. And see, it says Tarash defense, it's just a different move order. But usually white would already have a queen's gambit with d4, c4. So black is ahead of that, right? And then now white does. It. So now we have a Tarash. Knight c6, knight c3, knight f6. Well, it says, see, it says um, symmetrical variation. So pure symmetry takes takes a3, a6. This looks a bit like a queen's gambit accepted for white, as if as if white had black playing queen's gambit accepted. You get that exact same structure. And now again, how do we get to symmetry? Well, comes back b6, bishop b2, castles, queen d2, queen e7. Now the queen is misplaced on d2. Again, this was 1907. So theory of queen's pawn game with queen's gambit wasn't so well developed at that point. So there's just something nowadays, you know, you just don't really go queen d2. And this is this is part of the reason that Rubenstein gained an advantage. The queen is not, not meant to be there. Now queen e7, again, black is playing as so he has the white pieces. Normally white would have the center pawn on d4, bishop, bishop d3, queen d2 maybe, or bishop c4, for example. The queen usually goes to e2, and you try to show the advantage of having superior king placement. So queen placement. So for example, a lot of times black will have queen c7 and white will have queen e2, bishop d3. And then rook c1 will try to embarrass the queen on c7 and make her move again. So now we're going to embarrass the queen on g2 and say, what are you doing there? Well, you got to move. Gaining tempo. Bishop there, bishop goes to d3. Queen's just on the wrong spot. She actually is, if I recall, going to g2. So usually what you do is you wait for them to move the bishop and you take. Is so that the black was the pawn? What's that? Oh, why didn't he play one take? So he played oh, good point. Yeah, yeah. Not, maybe that's what he had in mind. Um, it's a sacrifice. That good question. Uh, we, as you can see, he's already moved the queen once. Black has already castled, and the theme here you're seeing, apart from symmetry, we're going to see the lead in development. So you can imagine this would be very dangerous. Let's look at. Let's see what it would look like. The queen is still going to be vulnerable. I mean, look at that. Even I don't know. Bishop b six, for instance. That's. You know, they say often how many tempos, maybe two tempos, right, would be worth the pawn. We have four out and we're castled versus three out, and the queen's getting chased around. You can just sense it's not so good. I mean, I guess you could say, oh, queen, D, queen g5, kf6. Otherwise, she's going to queen shake. She's threatening g7 and e7. Um, what yeah. about queen g5 here? That's what I'm saying, queen g5. You're going to have to see f6, probably. F6. Um, so let's see, where is she even going to go? H4, for instance. H4. Let's just say an example. Yeah, you can just sense um, it's it's a huge lead in development. And you'll see similar to the game, we're going to be able to get the rooks on the files first. We have two open files, D file, C file. I mean, what's white really going to do here, right? We'd have to look at, like, you know, concrete variations. But we can probably start looking at similar to uh, similar to another famous game, the uh, you know Morphe's Opera Box game or Night at the Opera, we I think we could start looking at some night takes. Night takes uh, before stuff that looks pretty dangerous. That you often do that in the French too. Night takes before. Yeah, that looks pretty bad, doesn't it? We'd have to. I mean, that's that's like beyond the scope of this 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 game, but uh, it didn't happen. But it's an interesting sideline, or at least beyond the scope instructively of the game. But yeah, I, that looks bad. Because then 92, he starts piling up on the night. White's not castling. White might lose the night. You know what I mean? It's bad, right? You see it? See how bad it is? Mm, yeah, yeah, nice point. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't do that, like just the notion that you have such a massive win development, it's very risky for white. So even if you just sense how risky it is, um, you can avoid, but there's probably, there are probably some concrete lines. That you can see. But yeah, we don't even have to prove it necessarily. 
actually it says a, a fine. Oh, speaking of which, it says a point. Here's what the line that it gives. On the on the left, it says a fine sacrifice of a pawn that says if C takes, E takes, knight takes D5, knight takes queen takes, rook D8, and black has a strong attack. Um, yeah, so saying, well, like I said, you can go bishop E6, but the other one is, is rook D8. So either way, we're seeing that lead in development. Um, yeah, probably both are fine. Okay, so going forward to the main line. So he ignores, oh, yeah, he ignores the pawn. Bishop D3. And he's literally blocking his attack. Takes, takes. And as I said, you usually wait for it to come out, then you take. Okay. okay. So we have rook d8, same thing anyway. So making the bishop, well, making the queen uncomfortable and the bishop uncomfortable on the d5. So the queen moves away. But you see, we're gaining a lot of time. What do we have now? Again, we have, we're castled. We have five pieces activated. They have five pieces activated. They're not castled. And a tower move. So you see, this is where we're getting the symmetry. There you go, right? Almost symmetry, but it's our move. Now it goes 95. I mean, I suppose you can go rook ac8, and you can already see it. We have two rooks out, but that wouldn't necessarily be decisive. It's like, well, white can move the rooks out too. What does black really have? This is where he's trying, again, trying to get something from apparently nothing. And I guess, you know, we're, we're up. We have an extra piece developed, and it's our move. So like kind of one and a half moves in. So 95. Knight takes bishop takes. We're sort of provoking f4. Now, we actually have a very direct threat. I mean, at least we'd win, win a pawn. We should win a pawn with queen d6. It looks bad. Or they have to double the pawns. We could look at that for a minute, but I don't think he wants queen d6 and so forth. Or bishop takes h2 check and then queen d6 check, right? I think we just win a queen pawn there. I mean, he can go rook fd1, but he's uncomfortable with that, so he plays f4. But this is probably a mistake. I mean, you're starting to see this is the beginning of going the wrong way. But see, there's white she, white breaks the symmetry beginning with this nuts. Okay, guys, guys. All right. So we have takes f4, bishop c7, e4. So we're starting to see, um, to the untrained eye, this, it looks pretty good for white. Um, now, sometimes this can work, you know, but not here. Why do you think this is not so great for white? It just, just, you know, again, we don't even need necessarily a line to justify this. Well, we will see. <laughs> we're going to see a brilliant line, but just we'll, we'll look into some lines, right? But later on, you'll see the main line. But just to give a sense, why why is this not good for white? Um, there, there are a lot of weaknesses with the pawn structure and lots of squares where black can get in and the um black's bishops are more coordinated on their diagonals whereas white's dark square bishop is bad and well, the light square bishop's not much better, and on the if it does try to move away, that is the light square bishop, then that leaves the D file open. I mean, I don't think at this point it would be premature for Black's D rook to do anything, but there's that. There's the threat. Sorry, um, what's the last one you said? What's the threat? Of, of uh, if the light square bishop chooses to go somewhere else, although there's not really any, anywhere worth going at this point, it would leave that file open, even though even though it would be premature for Black to take advantage of that. That's right, still... Right. And you're seeing tactically it's a loose piece. D3 yes. is a loose piece. It's either, you know, as we've talked about kind of mathematically, it's either defended once and attacked once, or undefended and not attacked, but it's loose because it can be, if it's a you know, it could be attacked easily. Like right now, what if we add, what if we add a little more pressure? The queen has to be tied to it. And we are going to see this. Uh, this is going to be proven in this game. We're going to see an example. It's not always proven that it's bad, but it's certainly a risk. Have it. So, for example, white might consider, you know, guarding it with a rook, right? So, white, you know, obviously white misplays this, which is why it's the immortal game. It's, uh, I mean, Rubenstein's immortal game, just like the immortal game. You know, it, your opponent has to help you create a masterpiece. If they play it perfectly, be at least a draw, right? Should be. So your opponent helps. 
Now, E4 is beginning an overextension too. And as you said about the bishop, now I would push back on one thing. Everything else I agree with, the bishop on B2 is not a bad bishop. It's not a bad piece. It's actually currently a good piece because the knight just moves easily, right? The knight moves, boom, that bishop is attacking. Now, similarly, the bishop on D3, it's, it's a little vulnerable. It can easily be guarded more, but you play E5, the bishop's good. But keep in mind, if white goes E5, then the bishop's bad on B2. Does that make sense, Leah? Yes. They, both, they, they can't really both be good right now. I guess maybe the, the, a better term is they're not great bishops, which is not a technical term, but I think in a position like this where they're not bad, but there's still nowhere really for them to go is maybe that's a better descriptor. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of where I push back, yeah, yeah. Technically a bad bishop, like, right. If they play e5, then it gets bad, right? And then we can't say e4 is like bad bishop because you get open, right? But in terms of activity, just keep in mind, the bishop on b2, it's an aggressive piece. Bishop on d3 can become an aggressive piece, but then at the expense of the bishop on b2. But like, let's say e5, that's a little worrisome, actually. Because if e5 is played, then you start looking at bishop sac classic bishop sacrifice stuff, in some cases, on h7. At least you have to worry about it. Like e5, knight moves, queen h5 stuff. Maybe the rook lifts before e4, e5 is played, before the bishop opens up on f3, right? Rook f3, rook g3, you see what I mean? So it's kind of like, yes. a, right? It's very similar to a bird. Bishop on b2, pawn on f4, or maybe uh, close Sicilian, you see what I mean? Well, b3 Sicilian, I suppose. Uh, or, but anyway, the bishop on b2 is on the diagonal. The f pawn's there on f4. It's kind of, you know, white has, black has to worry a bit, right? So there is that. That's where I push back. The bishops can become active. Um, but other than that, yeah, white is behind in development. Most importantly, there's the, the diagonal problem. So as you can see, like the pawn on e5, I mentioned, it'll pawn push to e5 would open the d3 bishop but block the b2 bishop. Now, at the same time, it would open both the black bishops, obviously bishop b6 check. And then you have both bishops just streaming and just breathing fine. That's exactly what happens in the game. And this is this is a great example of overextension. So obviously black just has to be a little careful here um, with the pawn push, but here, there he does it now. Both rooks out. And, and this is, uh, you know, the, this is the precursor and kind of foreshadowing what's to come. All this, all, all these moves work in Black's favor. So again, look at the development though. Two, four, six out. I always like when the bishops and rooks kind of work together. So you have two, four, six out versus four out, kind of the rook on F1 might come out. But um, so we basically have four activated pieces for white, six activated for black. Also, we can say that currently a Black's king has more protection because F4 it matters and his bishop B6. Um, of course, white wants to attack the king side, but he's not there yet. Black's move. Uh, sorry, now it's once again. Oh, so e5 is played. Now we see the response. So e5 is played. Bishop b6 check. Look at the bishops. See, now we see it. And, and now you can see, Leia, as you mentioned, well, again, b2 bishop is, now it's literally a bad bishop by definition, blocked by pawn. The d3 bishop is, see, now that's active, right, as I mentioned. But, so we both had something that, something there, right? But the d3 bishop is loose, as we see. It is a loose piece. It is under defended because again, tactically, you see, so it can matter. So, for example, this allows a tactical move like knight g4. We hang our knight, but d3 would also hang there. Imagine white had a bishop on like a similar to black's kind of in terms of like maybe b3 or a2. Wouldn't be a great bishop, but at least it wouldn't be vulnerable and kind of white would hold the balance at least. But yeah, knight g4 is possible. Otherwise, black would have to play like h5 first which wouldn't necessarily be clear, right? There was no time for that here. So knight g4, hang the knight, lure the queen away. Well, she doesn't take it. They go here to deal with it. Then this is just feeble. It's trying to make it work. It just doesn't work in this case. And then we have our combo. So already, again, this is where something is created from nothing. And as Fisher said, tactics flow from the superior position. So see, look, where's the symmetry? Right now. How many moves later are we? Black goes one, two, three, four, five. And here we see on move six, six moves in from symmetry. Boom, black is actually, I think it may be winning already, but at least the winning line comes out of this. Well, there's a big threat. So what do you guys think the threat is right now? Oh, Uday got disconnected in with the monsoons. So hopefully it'll, it'll pop back on again. Um, but what do you guys think? What do you think the threat is here? There's, okay, like just imagine it's black's move and white doesn't do anything white. Now white challenges the bishop on the diagonal which means that actually it looks like white is pretty much threatening the 9G4. Now the knight's loose. Um, it is obviously it's a hanging piece. So it's kind of tit for tat. Well, you take mine, I take yours. 
and I have the bishops. I don't know if, if white should have done that in hindsight, maybe, but obviously it's bad because if you take g4, come in, right? But bishop e4 tries to deal with that. Even now, we could do something. But what's the main threat right now if if it's black's move? What would what would black do? Think about that. Um, I think it's queen h4. So queen h4 is very dangerous, right? If you get queen h4 in, well, we're threatening mate, right? Okay, what's the move? So let's give him a round. Yeah, just like a pass. Right? Okay, like eight, what? I don't know. Rook a c1, for example, like a normal looking move that doesn't work, right? So queen h4. Okay, it's a mate threat. King can't move away. Those bishops, like I said, the bishops are responsible or the success is attributable to the, the bishop here. I just love, yeah, you just got to love Black's position here. Nice and tight, no real weaknesses to explore. I mean, D6, hypothetically, second knight comes into D6, but that, that's irrelevant here. That's like the only thing that they could reach, maybe. And they're looking at H7, some targets, but they're not here. They're just not here. So in this position, so we have the bishops aiming in, we got the rooks aiming in, uh, which will actually um, help us in the main line. But this is a sideline, huge threat. Queen h2, and there's no defense, zero defense. Can't play g3 to allow the queen to guard laterally. G pawn's pinned. Okay, the only move is h3. H3 loses on the spot. So I'll pause the, I'll pause it for a second for anyone watching. I'll pause this and we'll think about what it is. Okay. So the answer is after, after queen h4, threatening uh, h2. So if, for example, like, yeah, rook c1. Okay, so h3 is, I mean, you can go bishop takes check, that's, you know, Spite check, you move your king. So it's over. There's no defense. Well, queen takes, queen takes, and then, okay, game over. So, and then you just keep coming at him with the extra six points, right? So after h3, what do you got? Queen takes h3, mate. Because the pin. So we have too much going on here with the bishop restraining the king. He couldn't have run. Well, knight two, and then uh, restraining, and then we have, yeah, threatening mate, block, still mate. Okay. So going back to the main line. So it just shows you the strength of the threats, right? So he tries to vision before. And now? Now we have our brilliant combo. How did this line come about? Did he What's just that? go on g5, check g4? What's that? Can he just go back to e4 and just play the moves? Are uh, you saying in terms of white's best defense? Or black's move? No, 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 I got this kind of after white played e4. What happened after that? Oh, you want rook ic8? So just fully developing. Again, he ends up doing that anyway, but uh, after he has this stuff coming. Now now he's really provoking e5. Why comes why gives it? And it's cool. I had a game like this once, not as brilliant as this game, but I was able to do a rook sack. Um, and I, I was thinking of this game. You know, he did f4, e4, e5, and I'm like, please come at me, right? So he has the bishop check now. So everything's coming in. Okay, now here's the brilliant moment. What do you think? Uh, right after, yeah, right after um, queen, uh, the natural queen h4. Then it, so we, that's the precursor. So we have queen h4. And he actually does have g3 now. That's only possible after bishop. So he sees that, right? So like, oh, I can't, I don't want to take the knight. So he's like, fine, I'll go bishop before. Still have the mate threat. Only, again, only thing you can do, g3. Um, actually, I guess you can go h3 too. That's another matter. Um, but then you have like, yeah, it's still bad. But anyway, he tries g3. So queen, sensible, queen guards laterally. And now combo begins, beautiful combo. So, I mean, look, if you do it not, what are you going to do? Like, he has to know this. If if you, you, he's in, right? He's he's all in right now. If he moves the queen, he's going to lose a piece, right? Pretty sure. Queen h3, take b7. Uh, queen retreats to, to e7 to guard the bishop. Then queen just takes probably, uh, still not great. Yeah, still some problems after rook takes c3, undermining e4. But yeah, uh, he wants to do something more drastic than that, more decisive. So this is a brilliant moment. So Uday, um, do you know this moment? As I was asking before, Leia, you know this. We talked about this. Uday, do you do you know this position? 
It's a famous visit. Uh, yeah, it's beginning. Uh, and then the puzzle, I've seen a puzzle. In, uh, there's a puzzle that becomes on the next move. What do you, do you know what it is? Are you familiar with this position? I mean, I vaguely remember coming the next move, yeah. Start with the next move. So you, I've seen it in a in, in a what's it called? Combination challenge, mm -hmm. red and white. But combination challenge, I think, features and on the next move. So first move, well, look, we're trying to undermine the bishop on e4, right? Trying to prove that it's under defense. Mm -hmm. you take e4, it could be mate if the pieces are in the wrong place for white, right? So what? Do you, wait, do you know what the first move is? Or I'll pause it for a second. Anyone watching to think about it? Yeah. Ooh, now you said rook takes c3. Good. So you have g3, rook takes c3. You take, well, it takes the queen. Um, now, how else do we justify it? Now, the, the most basic justification is after bishop takes. Again, well, we have a few, we have different angles to mate him from, right? So one way is queen takes h2, and another way is by streaming through the diagonal, those fire-beating bishops on the diagonal, beautiful bishops, right? So you just, you just got to love it, right? The rooks coming in, bishops, just showing you the power of long-range pieces, and then you have the knight. Queen it. Uh, no, this is the two mate ideas. Well, basically, focal point on h. So as you can see, oh, yeah. as you can see, it would work out with bishop takes check, right? So the so this would be the this would be the direct mate line. You see that? No defense against mate and two. You see that? Either well, queen can't take, and if the rook blocks, you take forced mate and two. Even queen blocks. Queen takes h two mate. Queen here still a nice mate right there, based on the page. You see it? So that's the direct, that's the direct idea. So we have, but the thing is, you know, this is like a multiple weaknesses scenario, right? So we have uh oops, sorry, that's the move. <laughs> but okay, why is it? Okay, well, we found the first move, we found that. So why does rook teach this is the puzzle usually? Sorry, I went forward one, but anyway, um, just to know it. To know why. Uh, it's good to it's good to analyze. Yeah, that, that well, then you have to analyze the next move from there. Why? So again, same concept. Once we know that we need to take e4, any anything, whatever it is, whatever it takes, by any means necessary, we got to make this happen. We just need to take e4. So we're trying to decoy the queen. It's like if you're going for back ring, but you know that famous Capablanca game where he keeps hanging his queen on like b2 or something. He keeps hanging. It's a puzzle too, right? It's based on that. You are you guys familiar with that? He keeps hanging his queen, and then the queen can't take because there's a back rank mate. You guys know that it's very similar, but this is a cooler mate because it's a diagonal mate. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's worth looking that up if you don't know it. You can probably find it too. But yeah, just keep that one in mind. So same concept, same exact concept. It looks, but the cool thing is like he saw this whole thing beforehand. Well, remember when he played, it's one of those things like the game of the century by Fisher. Once he's all in, he has to see the whole thing up to the point where he like sacks some stuff and then he sacks the queen and then he sees the exact way in which he's going to get three pieces, a rook and two pieces for a queen. But I was really deep to see that it worked perfectly. It was like a 17 half move combo or something which is why it's the game of the century. But this is really cool too, because again, we're just doing our building moves. You don't have to see ahead too much right now. But when you when you commit to knight g4, look at that. So in terms of half moves, we have one, two, oh, there's other ways too, but in this line, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's, we're not done yet, right? It's like at least 10 half moves. So six, seven. Okay, now why is this move working? As you said, queen actually can't take um queen takes bishop takes check now it looked hold on a second what's the full line queen does take so what's the full line i mean what else is there you're about to take a free queen and then you're still going to make them on h2 see you make them from a different angle now you have the bishop takes mate idea but if they respond to that you still have rook h2 mate because the bishop covering here so you have too many angles you have this angle with the queen on h2 straight on the file you have the second rank mate. You have the rook on c3 that's taken the knight, undermining the bishop to help you on the diagonal. But also that breaks through, which allows the rook to do its own things because the bishop doesn't have time to take it. Because again, rook takes e2 and the rook h2 mate. Pretty much, I think it's unstoppable. Let's take a look at that, actually. It's interesting. What if he decides to give it up? Aha. We don't take the queen. What do we do? We go the other way. You take the queen. He has, ah, does that work? No, no, that still <laughs> probably works. Bishop g2, we have bishop takes mate. But we can also play, I think we can just do this one, mating immediately. Same concept. It's just the rook takes instead of the queen. Boom. You can, Boom. You can do either thing. way. You can take either way. What's that? You're saying the other you way too? Take the queen as well. Yeah, yeah, they're both mate. 
I mean, we'll take forcing we line. Take, uh, we'll, we'll forcing take, line's yeah. fine. You're still, yeah, same thing. We're still, he broke up again. We're still threatening mate on h2, and there's zero. As I said, bishop g2, bishop takes mate, uh, whatever else he does. I mean, it kind of takes a little longer, right, Uday? It just takes a little longer. I mean, he could do a sp kind of a spite block, right? Okay, you block. Um, we could block again. I don't think there's a defense after. Oh, wait. Yeah, you see, it's a little more complicated because, like, rook takes. Then he has bishop block. Then you have bishop takes, and then he moves over. Now you do this move. Same thing. Same exact concept, just more brutal. <laughs> and now we have rook g1 double mate come, double check mate. Right, something like this, we can do that. Uh, and you can actually take h2 and it's still double checkmate because the bishop's something. Anyway, you, you're hitting him. Oh, that's really cool. You're hitting him from every single angle. So it's all lost at that point. So here, queen does take. Then what? Great move right now. So again, every move is brilliant. Okay, nice. Now, okay, this is, we can find this. We can find the hanging knight move, right? Pretty direct tactic. Oh, they take, they take, we take tit for tat. Okay. Then we look for this. This is easy, right? We threaten mate. We all can do that. Anyone uh, who knows a 500 level puzzle has to have a mate, right? Or maybe 800, I don't know. Okay, G3. Um, now that's pretty complex because we are hanging our queen. But even beyond that, we have to ra we have to rationalize this. We have to show our rationale. We have to find rook D2. And then we have to prove our rook D2 works. So it's pretty hard. Yeah, it's nice. Again, if you look in combination challenge, I think it's here. But it's like any chess, like, like art of attack and chess. It shows you it's beyond the pure combo. What matters is, like if this, I think this may be, I don't recall if it's in there, but what matters is the setup of allowing the push. It's a very unique scenario. It's like hypermodern type of play, similar to hypermodern chess where you would, you would allow this early right out of the, in the opening. Now we're in the middle game, right? But the idea is you let wide overextend themselves. It's just now it's very clear. In a hypermodern game, you haven't proven it at the beginning. Now we're beginning to already prove it. They're overextended right away. And we have the combo to prove that. As Lasker said, what is it? Do you guys know the Lasker quote? It's like the combination lays bare the truth of the position, something like that. Do you guys know that quote? The la the combination is like, you know, just the truth of the position, right? Something along those lines. So G3 takes, take, take. So we have this and then brilliant move. Another brilliant move. And again, you have to see this ahead of time. What's the move? I mean, what comes to mind first, of course, most obvious move, but then, the, then there's the follow through. Most obvious move right now is what? Bishop. Right, bishop. again, your bishop move. It's not mate yet though, right? In this case, it's not direct mate. You get bishop takes check, and then they effectively have to block with the queen. I mean, they can toss away a rook. Why would they just do that? It doesn't help them. So they go queen g2. And now the brilliant finish. But again, it's it's brilliant, but it's all following the same theme. We just have to be fixated. But I remember looking at this. I'm like, oh, wait, wait, what is this move? It's really tricky to find. It's just not vi um, uh, basically visually. In terms of visualization, it's tricky. But you're still doing the same thing. Don't take the queen. Resist the temptation. Don't take that queen. Rook okay. Rook where? Edge three. Yes, rook edge three. And also, it's important. Don't take the queen. Don't go rook c2 either. It's Again, it, it allows them to just hold on more. They can't take e4, but they, you know, rook c2 gets more complex, I think. So we don't need all that. We just go rook h3. Instant win. Boom. Game over. Again, as you see, the rook takes h2. Oh, rook c2 also do not take the queen interestingly don't take the queen you get a fork but then they come up and you're down in exchange so now you're probably yeah it's a losing position why should you win this by bringing the rooks in so we don't do that and and the other thing that you should not do you have to notice the difference you got to be precise we already see this as winning and then you take right there's no way to stop this if the queen takes the same thing the bishop on b6 stops the king from moving so he's stuck he's in a mating net long i love it long range mating net short range knight helps it out but uh, for the focal point. Now, rook c2, why does it? Well, again, we want the smoothest win. Uh, oh, we got disconnected again. We want the smoothest win. So what do you think, Leia? Um, I mean, they can hold us off. Yeah, Uday, I mean, it's still winning, I'm sure. I imagine it's still winning. But why let them, why let them, why give them any chances to, to hang on? It's going to be much more difficult. 
what would be the what's going to happen after uh well the only way they can hasten or um not hasten the only way they can slow down their demise to delay it a little bit is which move right they have regret too we don't need that right we don't need that i'm sure it's still mating it's got to be mating but we have to look at a little more like what it rook takes they have rook g1 yeah yeah we actually have a smothered mate there <laughs> uh yeah it still works well you're threatening um it's still it's going to take you more, it's just more complicated why do we we want to keep things simple don't don't give the don't yeah. give the wrong okay what's the smothered mate line oh he's gone again the monsoons yeah What's the smothered mate? LA, do you see a smothered mate line? There are different ways to win. We can also take the queen and check them on the back rank. We can wrap around this way. Uday, you see that one? Yeah, you came back. We can take and then we could come down. That's also nice. Uh, that works. But we also have an elegant, ele elegant smothered mate with the knight. Do you see? I think so. Let's go back to that. What, what, was the, what would the smothered mate be? As you said, rook h3. But just to prove uh, that rook c2 doesn't is not as good. Or no, it just takes longer. Why calculate that? Just get your cool win with rook h3 and mate. Um, yeah, so it looks like, well, you're threatening rook, still plowing through. But yeah, I mean, it's just more complicated. Like they all have rook e1 also and stuff. But assuming they go rook g1, what's the win? Forced forced mate. One, two, wait, hold knight on. F2. Hold on a second. Yeah, we're getting knight f2. Hold on a second. What's the best way to do this? How are we getting it? Wait a second. No, not bishop takes. That doesn't work, I think. Does bishop takes work? I mean, again, it's just more like, why do we have to think about it? We shouldn't need to think about this. <laughs> we should just know it's over, right? But uh, funny enough, we can also, uh, we could take take on b2 also. <laughs> we could just eat stuff. But why? Actually, I'm not sure that, that bishop takes works. Why not? We could look at rook takes as well. But why does bishop takes queen maybe not work here? Does it? No, I don't think it works, actually. Why not? So we're going to go for a rook f1 check next, right? Does it work? Uh, Uday, is it made or no? It broke up. Yeah, I think it's made. Bishop takes g2, rook takes g2, rook f1. Rook G1, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rook G1. No, no, we mate. don't, yeah, we don't have our knight mate though. I was trying to make knight. Yeah, we just do it. But we but the knight mate fails. Funny, no. <laughs> see, now you have to do something like this. It's like, oh, we're still playing on. Check. And okay, you're winning, but let's take a mate, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure if we have a smother mate with the knight, but we can use our rook on G1. All right. So check. And then beautiful move. Again, in itself, this is a great move. But again, like how many moves do we have to do to get there? We had to do, again, knight commitment. The commitment here. One, two, three, four. Uh, I thought if there was a like that. You have to see six moves. You have to see Is there a knight of two mate? Did you say there is a knight of two mate line? Yes, Yeah, rook two. And if you miss rook two one directly. Oh, yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't take it. You're right, yeah. Maybe I was looking at there. Yeah, yeah, you just do it. Right, right, right. Um, therefore, you're right. Because the night, yeah, everything is going to work. Therefore, um, the best they've got is rook f2. And I think we already proved that. Um, do we have knight takes line? We have like everything, but knight takes king g1, and then you move the knight, and then they have king f1. Oh, no, this is cool. You do this one, and then if they go king f1, bishop takes g2 as mate. I mean, you could win from every direction. It's just too much. You saw that one? Why do you want a knight mate so badly? I mean, everything works. What's that? Why do you want a knight checkmate so badly? No, just to prove, just to show. I was seeing if the knight check. I was just saying, oh, it looks like we have a knight mate. Yeah, and I think we do. Uh, but just showing all the ways in which we, we which we can win. I mean, the rook mate is more mundane. <laughs> if we could win, it, it, well, again, this is the immortal game, so we have to win brilliantly. But the cool thing about um, just to show all the lines you had to consider. But yeah, the really nice thing about rook h three, it's just an interesting looking move, and it's not as obvious. That's the thing about you know that shows the brilliance of it though, because if it's one thing, if it's like oh, I come to c two, I hit the pinned queen, uh, and I can't you can't take because I plow through on the second rank. 
but the, again, it just it just it just shows you again. He already knew he had the win, which is good to know. Like it's reassuring to know. Oh, I can looks like I could just win that way. But this way is just immediate mate. Why is it mate in two? Right. You have to take this first to keep the pin. But again, if the queen takes his rook h two mate, otherwise rook h two mate. So it's got to be a mate. No, no, no. It's not a mate in two. They have that move, and then it's a mate in one. <laughs> so it's mate in three. I guess one. It'd be one and then two and then third move would be your uh, mate and again if we want to this way or this way <laughs> i would do the night again wouldn't you do the night come on gotta do the night i don't know it's up to you but we get to use everything and anyway, just to make it elegant why not? who doesn't like a smother mate um yeah so does that make sense how what, what's the lesson from the game uh how what are some like takeaways from this game What can you walk away with in a, using your own games? Some general concepts. Small positional advantages compound over time. And the converse is also true, whereas positional weaknesses can also compound as well. Exactly. From a defensive perspective, realizing that. And, you know, often we will take those risks. For example, Sometimes in a Sicilian, we play E5, like Sveshnikov type Sicilians, right? Um, like the so-called Boleslavsky hole. So we know that's a weakness, right? But there's some game, you know, you can play like E5 and F5 and you have some dark square control and some space. So, you know, we, we but but if you, but if it doesn't work out, it's just a gamble sort of, it, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're giving up, you're giving, you give squares to get squares kind of thing, right? So, uh, but yeah, it, but all of us being equal, it just adds up. Now, the, now this, how did this come about? Why? Well, in this case, it was the development advantage. One, it was the development advantage, largely attributable to this move, right? And again, if he had taken D5, it would probably be even worse. It would have been even worse, just overwhelming development advantage. And we see those in te textbook lead and development kind of thing. Silman has a nice game like that. I think it's a Christensen game that Silman covers. Nice Christensen game. I think it's in the workbook, yeah? It is how to reassess your chess work, which I recommend. As in like to accompany how to reassess your chess book. So queen e2, there you go. Now we have one, two, three, four, five. We have all of our minor pieces out. We've castle, we have a rookout. And then, but this is very important. You have to uncork somebody. You don't do, if you do the mundane a pedestrian move, that's been a theme this week, I see. Don't do the pedestrian move. We came up with a few of my students. Don't do that. Do this. And now, so it's the combination lead and development uncorking something, starting to make threats. Well, when you get rid of the knight, keep in mind, that's the thing, you, you scared him a bit, right? He's a little scared here because now it's black's bishops who are the monsters, right? White's bishops are okay. One of them is a little vulnerable on D3. You gotta worry about it a bit and guard it, but but black's the aiming at two focal points, H2, G2. Hey, who knows? Maybe we get a double bishop sacrifice or something. It's probably a little worried about that. So F4, then E4, let's see. This was okay, not great, but that's pretty much the, almost the, you know, this is where it got worse. And then really E5, that was kind of probably the losing move, just advancing his pawn. Now there may be some defenses, but oh, well, I'll click on, uh, it has stockfish or something, I'll click on it. But really that's the key move. So keep that in mind. This now, now, like I said, give squares to get squares. You gain space, but as we talked about, you block the bishop, you do open the bishop on D3, you block your bishop on B2. But if you're so if you're playing with white, for example, in a similar position, it will happen. You'll get positions like that where you know you have e pawn, f pawn, for example, or just the e pawn, and you choose should I push or not. Um, most of the time, it's not a bad thing. Like in many cases, like oh, I gain space, you know. But keep in mind, you're opening up that bishop. That's typical hypermodern idea, right? You want your opponent to advance. But again, hypermodern play, right in the opening, it's kind of a gamble. Like oh, I don't know, it's going to be imbalanced. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But here it's pretty clear that E5 is just already proven to be bad. Well, I'll click on the computer. Maybe it'll prove us wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's bad. Uh, bishop check, all this is forced, and you get knight G4. So for example, this is forced, well, unless he wants to play uh, rook F2, um, which can't be too good. And so let's say, uh, let's look at this position after E5. If I click on the computer, um, engine, oh, great, I have to turn on my VPN. Sorry, one sec. So annoying. All right, so if I pause that, I can use chessgames.com again. And let's refresh this. 
uh, well, someone's already see someone's already run the analysis and it's been uh, it's in the cloud. So it didn't even have to go for us. Uh, someone has run this for um, for move 19 to move 45. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think you have to look that deep. But basically what that means is that maybe uh, white can escape with a material deficit and then be down according to this five, five, five point two. Hold down a minute. Yeah, so that's bad. Um, so it's pretty, it, it, the computer is that Olga, I don't know who Olga is. There's like Leela, Olga, Stockfish, Komodo, Alpha Zero, Ribka, Shredder, uh, of course, Fritz back in the day, still there. Uh, okay, so anyhow, a Deep Blue, Deep Junior, right? Um, so here we go. So we, we've proven the computer also agrees. Oh, wait, he's coming back. The computer also agrees. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry, I didn't, I didn't pull up. Wait a second. This was it. This was, well, it says stockfish analysis. I'm not sure it has Olga. I don't know if you know about. Oh, our analysis using Olga. Maybe this, that's Olga. Maybe this is stockfish. Not 100% sure what that means. Uh, Uday, you see though, it says minus five. 37 plot, 37 half moves, right? So yeah, it's proving that it's good, as we see. The point is, so there, there is no, um, there is no defense, essentially. And, and that, if it's minus five, though, it means black is just going to be up materially, right? So white does have a way to stave off mate, but it's back. Okay, so we check. It's proven though that E5 is a losing move. Now, just, just I'm curious, but hold on a second. Right here, I'm sure it's better than, better than minus five for white if they don't play. Because again, I, my, my assumption, um, my hypothesis is that E5 is effectively the losing move after already having a bad position. But well, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's like worse, but not losing. Let me check real quick. So let's run engine. There you go, exactly. Minus 1.5, which is, you know, that's, you know, it's bad, but it's not like, you know, as it gets to minus two to minus three range, it means they're kind of winning uh, or losing territory. Minus 1.4, especially if at a human level, it'll swing, right? Oh, minus 1.5. Oh, they make one little mistake. Oh, back to, you know, minus 0.5 or something. Like that. More, more playable position. It's obviously a really bad position, but hey, I mean, Black needs to really prove it. Now Black proves it through the combo. Okay, hold on a second. I, ne I need to pull up the Lasker quote. Lasker quote lays bare truth combination something like that you see um lasker's quotation here it is so we have um the creative combination lays bare the presumption of lies the merciless fact culmination in checkmate contradicts the hypocrites i'm not sure there might be different uh it's probably from german right there may be different i think i've seen a different translation if i recall like let's see this one this this is the same one i thought it was slightly different maybe yeah, yeah, see, there's the sort of different way, different uh, order, move order. On the chessboard, lies and hypocrisy do not survive long. The creative combination lays bare the presumption of, like, yeah, so it's just like, you can you can translate it differently. I think I've seen that one. Anyhow, um, then we have our Ryshevsky game coming up. Great player, amazing player too. But uh, going back, so yeah, the, interestingly, yeah, so, so this is the move. You can see it's not that terrible for White. White's a little weak, you know, as I said little loose, but you know that Rubenstein is looking and he wants E5 to be played. <laughs> he wants it to be played. He has a great position, but it's not winning. E5 minus five, as it says, it's winning. Because you have knight G4, brilliant. And that's the beginning of the, it's mostly brilliant because it wants to follow. And you see, and again, we see the lies on the board, the lies of uh, the problems um, or the reason or the truth of it really is that he, well, he has told lies. He has made bad moves that he was hoping to get away with, and he did not get away with them. And then we have the brilliant follow-up. Again, every move is brilliant, because, especially because he calculated ahead of time. All right, um, so let's check out the other one. So this is like Mises versus Ryshevsky, uh, England, Margate, England, uh, 1935. So we have Kara Khan. A great game also. I definitely recommend the, quote, heavy artillery game as an older game by Capablanca versus Nimzovich. Look up heavy artillery in the Karakon. So Ivor C, again, exploitation of overextension. This is different though. It's not really about overextension. Again, development. So E4, C6, E45. So you see, despite symmetry, the development's important. But, but keep in mind, remember the Rook AC8 line, the kind of mundane line before the combo happened? If you had done something else instead of, uh, I think it was instead of like Knight G4 or something, if you had done the mundane move, it wouldn't have been that great. So we have to seize the moment. Now, night, night, this is not a good line. 
Now you either go uh, H5 or E5. Actually, I played a guy in India. Uh, this was in Bhopal, and he played uh, he played knight G3. And I, I went to H5. I think H5 is supposed to be better than E5. I know they're both moves. But it's like H5, uh, he ends up, yeah, it just gets awkward. Now he plays H4, then I go bishop G4, provoking F3. I ended up winning an exchange, but he held the position. Can you show the opening again real quick? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. so it's E4, C6, D4, D5. Knight C3, probably the best move for white. People like, again, E5 is, I don't like it that much. I think it's just a better version than a French for black. But then that bishop gets out, so takes, takes, probably among the best moves, knight C3. Takes, takes. I have six. So I like room. I, I did a video. People tend to like that a lot because they're very interested in the uh, uh, in, in the uh, Bronstein Larson line. No, wait, what? Bronstein Larson, I think. Uh, with, with knight takes, g takes. Knight takes, e takes is very popular these days. Knight g3, and I think, I think h5 is supposed to be a bit better, but e5 is very interesting. Uh, maybe, maybe double check that. So bishop e6. Now, what's the idea here after e5? It's one of those scenarios where the pawn takes and then you take the queen and then you go knight g4 so it's a fork to set up a fork <laughs> you see queen takes queen king take i'll play it out just to show you the opening and then you go here so you're setting you're forking those two pawns to fork them on f2 so you, but it's awkward too because if he goes here you probably don't even care about if I mess up his structure you can easily get this pawn back i think so it's just you know a bishop pair better structure and black is better so uh yeah so he doesn't take but then pretty much is one of the scenarios like black is equalized. Now, not, not just equalized, doesn't want to draw though, just has no problems. So you have the check, queen back, bishop b4 looks bad, right? But c3, hey, provoking a little weakness on d3, then he tucks back. So he wants that, well, first of all, he just doesn't want the queen trade. Does he go for c4? No, because c4 actually loses the queen after bishop b4. So he just really doesn't want to trade queens. I mean, he's a stronger player, but I'm not going to draw with you. I want to keep more dynamics on the board. I mean, he might try to outplay him in an endgame, but not much to do there. He could probably find something, but if white plays very well, he can hold on. Now there are a lot of ways that we can work this in our favor. Funny enough, the queen's also on D2, and she will be uncomfortable on D2 with the rook coming, right? So we have C5. So look at this, though. This is an example, right? Very boring-looking position. If anything, white has the lead in development. Well, pretty similar, but we have no white has five out. Black has three out in castle. So why is little lead of development after the castle? So C5, like the knight, we want the knight on C6. You don't have to, you, if you want it on C6, play C5. I mean, I suppose you go knight D7, and then, you know, stick it on an E5, hop into C5. But he wants this move. Knight of five. Bishop takes. Now keep in mind, look at the knight moves. One, two. That was a, that was a wash, though, because they both took. Knight F6, he spent a move. Black did a developing move, went back. So he wastes a move there. Okay, bishop out, trade, trade. That, that doesn't waste any moves. We both take something. Actually, the queen gets to develop when she takes, for what it's worth. Queen check, develop a queen, retreat a queen. So he got a free, basically, they both kind of got a free develop move. He retreats, bishop comes out, bishop goes back. See, that's a wash, though. Basically, white got, quote, c3 and for, quote, free, but it didn't matter, right? If it, black doesn't mind. So you see, we spend two bishop moves. Or a pawn move. So in, in other words, black spent one move on developing the bishop. So it's important to understand this. It's not that it moved twice. It spent one move effectively with insertion of c3, which doesn't help white really. Okay, bishop d3, castles, normal move. Normally, now keep in mind, c5 spends a move on that. Now he spent keep, now he spent several moves on the knight now. And then you see the, the difference. So now we have bishop takes. Well, he's hitting the bishop. We're not going to like overreact with bishop d8. We just take. Now keep in mind, whenever you have a situation like that, uh, bishop it's like bishop c5 uh takes g1 or something like uh, uh what are we talking about yeah, yeah bishop c5 takes g1 or something she's kind of wasting moves right that kind of thing or bishop f5 takes b1 so now we have the bishop just comes out trades itself off so they're spending all and they have to spend a move to take back that's equal but now we've we've just developed and traded off the bishop so you can see now okay now we have four out versus four out plus we're castle now black is up a temple white finally the castle then another temple on the queen so you see how we've gained tempos with all the knight moves, right? And then rook here. So a lot of it was a wash, but it was the knight moves and rook d8. And then we have, okay, kick it out. See, again, you could say, oh, you make white move away. But really, what's the tempo gain? g6. Not a massive tempo, but it does it does help out 
kills the diagonal threats and gives them a loof for what it's worth. You have to worry about Bishop H6. But that, that's a free move, not a huge move to have. So that doesn't keep in mind. When does it matter? When does it not? Rook AD8 matters. That's a free rook move. And then here we go. He takes that one. There's the other one. Now he's making it's very it's funny. It's very similar to the last game in terms of rook tempos. And then the queen getting awkward. And here we are. See now, so we went from symmetry to, to big lead and development. We again we have two rooks. It's very similar. It's funny. I just thought of the game when we looked at the other one. See, has the two rooks out for free. C4, why not? So they were now he's the one pushing forward. It's not like we say, oh, you can never push your pawn forward. It's just the last one was a very bad example because why what's the difference? Well, black had a lead in development, black had all those diagonals to use, block the bishop on b2. So we saw these drawbacks. Well, how many drawbacks are to this move? Well, there is something. There's one main drawback which that we do have to think about. Now we've opened up the queen laterally, we've gained space, we're latching onto the d3 square. But what is, think about this, what is the draw? What is the only real drawback of this move? Apart from maybe needing to defend this, what's the main drawback? Drawback of what? Uh, what, what is it, Uday? What's the one weakness of this? Really the main drawback thing? of C4. What, what about C4? You're saying it's vulnerable? No. What are you asking? It's breaking up. It's breaking up. I heard you say C4, though. Are you asking me if C4 is the move I'm talking about as the weakness? Is the weakening move? Well, there's one drawback I'm saying. Can it be attacked? No. What is your question? I heard something about C4, but I can't. I heard no. That's all I heard. Or feel free to type it if it's breaking up. But what are you asking about the move? Or would you try again? Alaya, could you hear him or no? No. Yeah, it broke up, unfortunately. But I heard him say C4 asking a comment. Uh, oh, go ahead. I hear you now. What's that? Uh, you're talking, well, what, what I think it is is G4 for the night. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think I heard the night. Is that that's what I think? That's what I think the answer is. Uh, there might be more than that, but I think that's the main that's the main commitment you're making. Now, I mean, okay, maybe something like if you move your queen, maybe some way. It's pretty unlikely. I mean, you never know. You have like b five. You know, you never know. This, the pawn itself is probably a little more attackable because it's pushed into the opponent's territory. So you're sticking your neck. Oh, you wrote something. Yeah, just type it. Uh, drawback of c four. Only one. Yeah, feel free to type it if it's just like the one thing you want to type. The one thing you want to, if you have like one main thing you want to say about it. But yeah, I mean, you you keep in mind, you are moving into this territory. The Anytime you move a pawn, it's a commitment. It's very important to understand. And you are, uh, you're encroaching on their territory, but you are sticking your neck out a little bit anytime you do that, right? So yeah, it could become vulnerable in the future. But really, it's as I mentioned, I think it's the D4 square. that you know, he has it now. He didn't used to have it. Now we have the D3 square, though. That's the argument we're going to have. Whose square matters more, right? uh okay yeah, yeah you agree with me yeah that's really it i mean yeah again c4 pawn a little bit not probably not relevant you never know though like i said you never know like maybe they trade everything off and then he gets to d4 with the rook doubles up tempo on c4 you know maybe the queen goes swings over to here you know it's something it's something for sure but uh but this is more important i think more relevant is this one so you can use the square you know kind of hold off black's pieces uh you know that's his hope He's hoping to hold off black species. What do you say? Square, exactly. Yes. Did you hear? And Uday, could you hear me on? You could hear me though, right? Saying I agree. I just said yes in the chat. Yeah. Uh, you said, but ninety four, ninety five. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you're right. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It's an argument. So the but but that's what I'm saying. There is one drawback though. It doesn't mean that it's worth it. It doesn't mean that it's enough, which is why he did it. Because his argument is, it's a, it's a debate. The debate is my d3 square matters than more than your d4 square. But did he give him the square? He has access to it. Certainly, it's white's under white's control more. See, see um, the c pawn cards. So no black pieces are going there unless you play like b5, b4 or something, which would still be conceived. But you might, you know, again, this is all just very abstract. But white does have the d4 square to land on. He didn't used to. That's the difference. But yes, and we have this. And that's where, you know, maybe he tries not at four or something. But to stop you, but no, it's there. That's what I'm saying. Maybe rook d3 in the future. So let's see how it plays out. 
B4. Now he does not take on B3 on passant. Why not? Well, that would be bad. Uh, first of all, we give up the whole point of D3. Now, not, not to mention we have rook D3 ideas in the future. Maybe exchange that, who knows? We have that that square to use for the rook or the knight, as Uday said, yes. And if you take on passant, well, then it like just flew, his pawns become nice and fluid and the rook opens. However, if you leave it there, again, the C3 pawns more, it's actually a target. That's important, right? See, it's a target, maybe also A5. So you have a lot of ideas. Talk your queen back, no problem. So again, in terms of tempos, he spends a move with the pawn, you spend a move with the queen. Now he did spend a move with the pawn. See, look, again, he has his lead in development, but we're not, uh, for a similar example would be like, let's say the queen's not on not on E4. We, wouldn't, we probably wouldn't spend a move on rook F8, but we do so because it, it embarrasses the queen. We're actually sort of, the positional threat is bishop G5 and take E3 and maybe, maybe, stuff like that. But the queen's uncomfortable, so she moves. And then we do spend a move on C4, but that's, you know, but it's concrete, it's, it's purposeful. So this the, now, okay, so now white begins to catch up. White's effectively down one tempo. Now. And keep in mind, just another note, if we had taken on B3 and they take back, that would fix the development problem with the rook. It would be developed on the file. It's, for, it's worth something. The rook queen would have to move and maybe he thinks about taking or at least has pressure on A7 and so forth. So, and again, it would remove the C4 pawn that we kind of like. Gives us space. We're going to use that in our favor. There you go, day right? Now, interestingly, he does, you know, he doesn't let us in. But then we might have a better scenario. Now we're battling if he takes, which, you know, he does not. Then we're going to have better, uh, we're going to have better bishop against knight, hopefully, or we take and like mess up the structure or something like this. But this will lead to, you know, this development advantage. We're hoping to squeeze something out of this concrete. Now we're actually threatening something positional. What's the positional threat that black has right now? Via tactics, position of what is it? Yeah, I'll pause it while you think of the. Now it's a tactical move for positional ends. I mean, big position. I mean, it'll lead to more tactics, probably. We can't prove that yet. Um, it's bad. Yeah, it'll be very bad for white. What is the immediate threat? Tactical for positional ends. I'll pause it for a second. All right. Oh, so they mentioned 93 now. If we go for an ID3, and now this is not a tactical threat, right? That's what I'm getting as tactical. Now it's positional idea. It's a positional idea, but uh, perhaps it's not that decisive. It's probably not bad, but we have to prove that it's decisive. Okay, it takes, takes, knight c1. As I mentioned, if you don't do it right, if you don't do it in the right way, that could be possible. And then, um, you know, he wants to just liquidate. Maybe you double, I don't know, but... It, it's not, you'd have to look into that, but that's not, I don't, he wants something else, something very concrete. I mean, I do think we'll reach that if we can do it without being, uh, you know, bothered. Yeah. But what else, what else do you have? Knight of three. Correct, correct, knight of three. Knight of three check, I mean, that's more, I would say it's the kind of thing where you can't get too fixated. If you get fixed in 93, it's like, okay, how good is this? We can look into that. But this is pretty clear. Like, that's got to be good, right? So, again, give him a sample move, like A4 or whatever, just, just to be as no if he's oblivious. Um, but, you know, he might be. <laughs> you just have to know what well, White needs to know. He's not oblivious, so he needs to be aware, which is why he does something. Check. Okay, you're about to take. He's going to have to eventually take this because you're about to take. So, you may as well, either he moves, you take, he's going to take. You may as well take now. And I think we can say this is pretty good. I think we're pretty happy. Just as happy as having a... But see, remember, the knight on d3, it may be traded off. This is concrete. Can you win? I don't know, but it's. I'm pretty happy with this. It's positional, positional advantage, right? Again, we're trying to squeeze something out of this position. So you see, we're again, we're going back to c4 a few moves ago. Now, when you had c4, you didn't really have too much other than a lead in development. We, we have to keep in mind, the lead in development will evaporate if you don't make use of it. Like I said, in the last game, Rook AC8, Rooks come out, and in, uh, nothing much. So that's why he does, just like in the last game, remember he went 95. In th this case, and then, and then he starts pressing. In this case, the thing he does is he plays C4. That's the thing he does. Yeah, he goes G6. Probably not to go to E4, but anyway, this happens. But ultimately, he plays C4. That's his decision. Okay, so like, look, if he can get, if he can get this out of it. Oh, wait, oh, this is. Oh, that's why he goes not here. So he can take it back with the knight. That's why he reacted to it. 
Now, interestingly, he could have gone knight c3, and there is no knight c1. However, it doesn't work tactically. It just, no, it doesn't work tactically in this case. So he has to go, he actually has to do that, interestingly. But then we're saying, okay, fine, we don't get knight d3, but we get a good bishop against knight. It's the best you can get. And remember, c3 target, squeeze, maybe rook d3 if the rook moves, things like that. Uh, and back rank issue, he needs to deal with the back rank. Probably spend a move on that. So you can see he takes what he can get. Takes what, take what you can get, right? So we have, uh, again, if he's ignoring him, probably more concrete than that uh, would be this line, right? Would you guys be happy with this position with black? I mean, best you can get here, right? Can work this position, try to, yeah. I mean, I don't think white loves that, do you? Look at the, I mean, weakness is galore, right? And as I said, still all white has going for him is the D4 square. Uh, which he can't even use, and the c4 pawn, which he can't even attack. So white has nothing. <laughs> All right, this is just an example. So, you know, this is if he's oblivious. He's not oblivious. He's aware of it. But that's why he, ha he has to be aware of it and actually do something to prevent this, which is why he goes knight d4. See, there you go. He's utilizing that square defensively and counterattacking. So like I said, um, if you go knight d3, boom, knight b5. Oh, I saw you said something in the chat. Were you trying to say? Oh, now he's gone. Uh, yeah, that's bad. I don't think that's going to work out for us. Nope. We're going to lose. We're going to lose an exchange. Forks, you move. We got to lose an exchange. Yeah, the knight's good, but it's probably not worth an exchange. It's just an exchange down. Can't do much with the knight there. Not enough. Therefore, we still do the check. Again, best you can get. Best you can get here. Now, if he interestingly, if he were, if he were to move the king, I think now we do not take this because similarly the knight will take back, almost transposing, except the king would. We would probably do this. Now the bishop's hanging. Bishop takes bishop. Now I think we're going for not take back. We win material. Take. Oh wait, do we? Do we? Maybe not. Hold on. Take. No, because the rooks, we can't, if we take, no, maybe we don't. I don't think so. No, we, yes, we do. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. We wait, do. Wait. Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah, we went upon. No, wait. Rook oh, what's, it's C1, rook, wait, what's C, the rook yeah, C8, yeah, yeah, yeah. rook C1. We only get a pawn. We only get a pawn. What's the line? Rook C1, rook C1, knight takes uh, four. Pawn takes. Yeah, what's the, uh, rook you, say, C8. you said rook C8, right? Because if you take if you take here, it doesn't work. Because it's yeah. takes back. You said rook c8, right? And this doesn't work either. Yeah. Because then the rook, I don't think that works either, because then the rook takes uh, maybe, but it doesn't look good. The rook takes back and you don't have an attack anymore. Uday, you're saying rook c8 and then knight takes b4, right? Rook yeah. c1. Now, if he does something random, we take the bishop. So he has to counter us, we take the exchange. Uh and then we don't we just go ahead. We don't have any, too many tricks. We go takes, takes, and takes. Yeah. So we win a pawn and very good end game. So again, we take what we can get out of this, but that's that's about the best we can get in this position. Okay. Um, oh, they had to leave. Okay. So... So we can see, uh, point is, he takes. The other line's not great, so he takes. So yeah, this is the best we can get here. We take what we can get. But as you see, he didn't go for knight d3, even when he had the chance, you see? He did have a chance today, right? No, no, but tactically, it just failed. If it had worked, if it had worked tactic, again, this is where we have the positional tactical nexus, right? I, if he can get away with it, he might do it. But he couldn't do it because knight d5, see? So, uh, no, that's the full, yeah, and that's our just, justification. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that would, no, that was direct. That's why I did it. So we have knight free check, takes, takes. That's the best you can get. G3, funny enough, same thing happens, he goes back. But, look, I mean, this is what we can get out of it, and we have a better bishop overnight. We were hoping for a better knight. We didn't get it. We're flexible. We'll take what we can get. But we still have a nice edge. Still have something to work with, and he's not playing him. He's got a he's got a wedge pawn. He's got this wedge on c4. He's got a fixed target on c3. 
it's got a more active bishop. And if the knight, if the knight goes to d4, we can take and we could just, uh, yeah, have a pass pawn if we want. So it looks good. Maybe double on it or something. We have a lot of things to do. But the point is the knight can't go anywhere. The bishop's dominating it without being taken by the bishop, um, uh, you know, at, uh, at, at Black's will, as, however Black wants. Does that make sense? How he gets an edge. Yeah, not a huge edge, but it's something. He has some imbalances in his favor. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, there's the result. Look, it's the result of the this ideas of the knight check and superior placement, uh, C4, squeezing him. And ultimately, yeah, it takes, again, sometimes, you know, you can't get fixated. So knight D3 would have been great. Didn't work out. Said, fine, okay, I go for the exchange and I have a better, and now I'm actually the one with the better bishop. So here's how he works this. But again, that's the point. Starting with symmetry, using your lead in development, squeezing something. So now he feels the need to defend uh, C3. Great. We like that. Now we begin our operation to double. Naturally, he takes. It's like, what are you doing? Well, tempo on the knight. Very nice. He doesn't have time for rook d1. So if he doesn't do anything, we're going to double. And see, we're making it harder for him to play knight d4. Because then we're actually just going to pick off the pawn. Well, something like this happens. Brilliant. So he actually does take it. Okay, now what? Why is this justified? Well, it is a pass. We both have a passed pawn. Ours is more advanced. It's about to be taken. Why is this justified? Well, he his passed pawn is isolated. What's that? Passed pawn is what? Can he is better? You saying you can push it or what? His one is isolated and less behind. And and there's actually a very concrete tactic to win the D pawn. Can you find it? Uh, Black has better king safety. Interestingly, why is that? Because the queen looks here. That's important. Back rank mate, right? So this enables you to get away with. So this again, well, in this case tactical end to achieve a pawn, <laughs> to achieve a, a, a free pass pawn right there, and you're going to win. Should be a huge advantage. Well, if you have rook queen. Or queen queen, queen and pawn endgame with a passed pawn coming, you should win. Because you get like, you know, anchor queen d3, c3, as long as there's a perpetual check. Often a little trick is you have your queen on the diagonal, right? Things like that. So he doesn't want the rook. He, he can't really even get a queen and pawn endgame, endgame here anyway. It probably won't happen. But uh, how does he win the d4 pawn? I'll pause that. Think about how he wins the d4 pawn here. One nice move, tactical rationale. Justification there. Yeah, so we no, he's not losing four point. Queen f three. Mm, he can take actually. I think so. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh you're, saying, uh, you're saying rook, uh, the no, rook, rookie no. two. Ah, yeah, rookie two. I guess. Yeah, but then rook. You have, have, have to play queen. Uh, probably queen rook f one. Not great, but he did give up the c pawn. I guess. What do you think? There's something else. It's something else. It's a way that allows you to win the pawn. You're going for his D pawn. Because again, you win the queen, D, queen one, pawn up, you're winning, basically. Now, now, interestingly, I think if we had a, if we had a rook and pawn endgame, we'd have more to prove. But interestingly, queen and rook versus queen and rook. Keep in mind, though, like I said, there's the back rank problem for white. So it's also that black has superior piece placement. Superior place, piece placement, not only a passed pawn, but one that's coming to C3 very soon. And, I mean, he happens to have a weak queen side, too. He's not careful. C3, rook, queen takes a4 stuff in the future. Rook wraps around, f2 square. I mean, a lot of problems here. So it should be a winning position now. What does black do? I mean, I think the d4, rook Rook, it's a rook move, yes? Rook where? Or just type it. It's breaking up. Yeah, I think you said it. I think I heard you say it. Just write type it if this is not right. You said this move. Uh rookie four, yes. You're about to take the pawn. He cannot stop you from taking the D pawn. It's all about can he get the C pawn? You take, and again, kind of one of those tit for tat scenarios where it, Probably white holds that. I mean, black might be a little better, but 
uh, you know, again, we can work on, we can figure that out, but uh, we don't need that. Again, we'll take the one that works for sure. Take our, take the best thing we can get. Don't go into that. And I think you said, Uday, you said uh, winning positions. He comes behind, he takes. But you said, I think you said winning tactic. Did you say rookie one check here? Yeah. Yes. And there, and there you go. It's because of, it's a de facto back rank mate scenario. It's not a mate, but he staves off mate and loses the queen. So we have back rank, we have de facto back, superior queen placement, pressure on the pawn, he gets tied up. De facto back rank mate tactical scenario combined with, uh, well, back rank weakness, let's say, combined with overloaded rook, right? We decoy the overloaded rook to stay. And he can, once again, two problems there against the top of. So this is a blunder. Uh, he didn't fall for that. But then he had a beautiful finish. Very nice move now. Like I said, I mean, you can try. This is tricky, actually. Because if you start pushing your pawn to C3, you know, uh, queen D2, even take, take, you know, king comes out. So really nice idea here. Can you find out what it is? Really good end game technique. You got to have a deep understanding of the end game here to play this move. So really a, pretty much a perfect game, really, from a strategic perspective. You saw the tactics, everything. Okay, let's pause here. Think about what it is. Black to move in and uh, win this end game. So the thing about queen A1 today, you mentioned queen A1 check king e2 c3 with the idea of queen b2 right here's the problem the king is too close so even to go there he just comes over yeah. he just goes king d3 you see nothing there so interestingly yeah. we're going to use this immediately we're going to create our we're going to make that pass pawn run now by itself <laughs> queen d3 check i believe let me double check i think it's right now yeah no no yeah, I mean, but... first, and then no you can't play queen d3 you like you lose the pawn but he does. He tosses in this. Well, first he's like, look, I mean, I guess, the, you know, you want to get your king in the game. So I suppose he could just toss it in now to have a superior version. It actually may make a huge difference. Oh, yeah. He wins the other pawn. That's the thing. All right. Got he it. He gets a superior. He, right. would... he gets. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fast. It's, it's brilliant, though, because, well, interestingly, by taking, it's bad because he can't. It takes him three moves to take the pawn. Every detail matters here. When he goes queen e2, you can't push because you hang your queen. So you just, but, but what do we do? We still take, but same thing. The king is diagonal from the pawn. So it takes him more time to get, every nuance matters. And like I said, I was like, wait, is that? No, it's the pre, it's the next move because he has the additional uh, king. Yeah, it's still tricky, but you can see the inclusion of king f8 and a5. I mean, you'd have to calculate every line, but we see the idea. It's a superior version. And now b5 is going to hang. Well, you, don't, you can count. All you have to do is count. How many moves? Uh, let's make arrows. How many moves is it going to take for white to activate the king after, let's say, the, the main line to, to consider? Take, take. So after the pawn is here, how many Four. moves does it take for white to defend the queen side? Yeah, three moves. By that time, the white king will be on c5 and he'll lead the pawn. Uh, wait, wait, hold on. No, no. Yeah, how many moves were, if he were to actually defend the king side? To actually get over there. Debate. As you said, three, he's here. Yeah, and as you Four. said, white's there. Black is there. Three moves, black's in. How many moves does it take white to actually be able to stave off black? Four. One, two. Yeah, he doesn't do anything. I mean, I mean I'll make that a different color to make it clearer. Let's do green. So it'd be one. Again, that's very important because if it were here, and then, you know, it's more, we can, again, we can calculate those sidelines, but let's just look at the main, the main idea. This is a sideline itself. We'll get you can go to the sideline of the sideline if you want. Line uh, you know, two A, two, or whatever you want to call. Okay. So we have here, here, one, two, three, four. That way, probably white's okay. Probably. You'd have to look at tempos and stuff, but at least it's a better version, obviously, than the other. Now, and then it only takes uh it's gonna be black's move after the trade, only takes three, and then you're gonna win the pawn. Game over. Start winning the pawns. Uh, you know, just beautiful technique till the end. Now he does queen e2. Um, let's go back. He takes it. What else are you going to do? Unless you have another preparatory move. You can't really have anything else. You don't need to push one of these pawns. You let him push. This doesn't do, I mean, you might consider pushing. It doesn't do anything. Just take. It's forced win. He knows it's a win. One, two. 
Okay. Well, actually, well, he hasn't taken the pawn yet. He said one, two, three. One, two, three. Yes, yes. We tossed the pawn at him. Opposition, game over. Final technique. Let's make this thing clear. Let's make it clearer. What do we do? What's the best move? I mean, you might have more than one move, but let's keep this. Yeah, let's keep this. Let's keep that's better technique. It's just clean technique because, again, you don't. The, I said this to a guy, uh, it was like a high school group. I was talking with them uh, at a tournament about the line. I'm like, look, just do this. I'm like, this line, you don't even have to think about it. He's like, what? Well, no, no, the other line required a lot of calculation. It's like, oh, you're just trying to be lazy. It's like, well, I'm thinking, is it, is it for the purpose of being lazy? Sort of. <laughs> but it's to but it's to no it's it's really efficiency and it's knowing that we're humans we make errors why should we do a line that requires us to think more than we need to see what i mean not you see for the sake of laziness but mostly for the sake of not of, of avoiding mistakes right keep it simple we also want to win as quickly as possible but i know when i play a6 oh no funny i know he took never, never mind but i know wait oh that's hilarious actually never mind because it I think a6 works though. Oh, maybe it's because it takes them to get here. I don't know. But I think a6, like, I'm like, look, take, take, take. Unless, no, you know what it is? No, I didn't look at this. You know what it is? Hold on. No, no, no. That's why. My bad. No, but it's, this is the easier scenario. But you have to look at that. It's funny. It's, it's ironic that I said that there. But um, no, the, because then you actually have to worry about it. You see what I You actually, never mind. I meant the other way around. Because in this case, you actually do have to worry. So fine, you have to calculate enough to know that you have to worry, right? right? But now then it, no, because now it gets deeper uh -huh. because you might get a weird scenario where, you know, these pawns are neutralized, move for move, lock it up, right? And now if these, these are locked up, so we treat this as this kind of draw. I don't know if it's winning or not, but again, no, funny enough, that I, that's actually my bad. Okay. You know, I might still be winning, but no, he keeps it. This simpler line, so I, I admit, I, admit I, mixed, I missed the move. Um, so we had the simpler line in this case is to take no, but I, I, you know, I'm thinking of like a Fisher game, I think, where he does do a six in the same scenario as both. Okay, this is different. So we have to double check, but I guess he knows for sure. Yeah, I mean, what does he have? You can just throw the pawn away, you can throw it away now. I mean, look, you go, you go here, you can go five and promote that pawn. You can do what. Yeah, you can probably push. Now you can promote that. You can probably push and get him into a stalemate scenario where you make him run out of, you know, he tosses his pawns at you, but it's not a stalemate and you mate. You know what I mean? You could do that. Or you could just ignore him and be like, well, actually, now you go up or you make a move. The king could run over to the king's side and eat those pawns. I mean, you could do whatever you want. But yeah, you're right. Like, this is kind of cool. I like those scenarios where it's like um, here. So he makes like some waiting moves. Um, what do we do here? We can... You'd have to, again, maybe I have to think about this a little more. I mean, I'm just going to probably, okay, let him go up here if he wants. Uh, waste moves. Sometimes you can, but again, this is the, now this is, this is the easy line. Let's, uh, that's, you know, you can definitely. Why not just promote that pawn? Yeah, because he won't run out of moves. Well, well here, okay, let's say you go here. Yeah, you can do that. Too. Why not just promote the B pawn? Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, finish it off. There's no, there's no stalemate potential anyway. I mean, you could take if you want. You go here, here, here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, go back a second. Now, if he really wants to not go there, that's a bad move. Let's say he goes here. So all else being equal, it would be a draw, right? So this I'm talking about. This, this kind of scenario is interesting. Uh, let's say you go here and here and here. So we have to time this out, right? But like, let's say you go here, something like this, and he's trying to move. Okay. So you let him do this. What's that? It's fine. This is a win. We both know that. You could come over here. There are some of scenarios, though, where like you can get him into a stalemate scenario where he's in front. It would be a stalemate otherwise, but then he has to start tossing his pawns at you, and you don't take all the pawns. You let him get a queen, and by the time, you know, again, we'd have to calculate that, but then you would get your queen and whatever. But we know let's probably just go and take his pawns. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you could do whatever you want. All right, I'm gonna pause it there. But yeah, what's uh, and then as for this one, you know, it's a very nuanced game because it's very important to know games like this. It's more advanced, right? But to know that you can, you can, yeah, a lot of finesse is in there. 
that are interesting. But overall idea, how what was it that he did that allowed this, you know, that that, you know, again, kind of getting something from nothing? What was it that he did to get that edge, to squeeze out that edge? Uh, I mean, I guess in the end it came down to that maneuvering with the knight. We did what? The knight. When he maneuvered I... with the knight a bit. Yeah. But no, it's before that though, because we can say, "Oh, make a knight maneuver," but it's deeper than that. Because what did he do before that? Why was that possible? Otherwise, he would have had nothing. What was it that he did to even get the possibility of doing that in the first place? It all comes down to the soul of chess, which allows the pieces to be better. What is that? Um, yeah, yeah, you need the, the precursor. So subtle C4. poverty. Well, this is cool. I mean, it's cool to know the opening to the E5 race play. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, he does some subtle maneuvering, right? He gets a lead in development. Now he has to squeeze something else. So the narrative is he gets to lead in development. He must squeeze something out of it. He plays C. He finds, I mean, look, it's not an obvious. I'm sure a lot of us would not play C4. A lot of us would, oh, I don't know, might go Bishop F6, might double row. Who knows? Maybe Bishop F6 looks pretty normal. Maybe a lot of us would play. Funny enough, yeah, you could probably go 95 then. A lot of us might do that. But this was very nice. Um, but look, even there, you know, he had to, as you said, the night maneuver. But then he has to understand this stuff too. So ultimately, it was a knight maneuver based on the pawn push, which was all possible due to in development. But then the important idea of what? Why? What's important here? There's the tact. There's the tactical idea of the check. So in other words, the flexibility of saying, "Hey, I may not be winning because the knight, but the knight's going to contribute to a better position. Lead in development, better pawn structure that we achieved. Minor piece intrusion, but we have to be flexible in the different ways. Now, what was the way ultimately that he had to? Transition into the win. The minor piece scenario. Again, the marriage of that with the pawn structure, the connection there. But what is it? Just to understand the full narrative. Many ways to win. What was the ultimate? Ultimate, what happened? You want to play a game? Uh, yeah, but ultimately, what was the final lesson to understand this? Right? What 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 happened with the minor pieces? Anyway, yeah, let's play like a bus game real quick. What happened with the minor pieces here? Because again, he did, I mean, he, he, yeah, he, he had a better night. Them but, off no, he never went. actually won because of the night wasn't the thing that won for him. It was contribute. It was a contributing factor. What was it? Like I uh, think. And, and how to exchange the ideas. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So so you give up what you, you, you know, This it's very important for mastery, right? Again, first the pawn structure, but this mastery of knowing, look, I, you know, a lot of people get fixated. It's like you won the knight d3. Yeah, okay, we love knight d3. But sometimes you don't get what you want there. So you say, all right, fine. I don't, I didn't really want this. I, I wanted my knight. <laughs> I didn't, this wasn't my original idea, but I have to be, I have to adapt. Right. That's why it seems obvious, but no, not really. I mean, who's going to, not everyone's going to find this, right? Take, reroute. Okay. You have a target, but you have to do it perfectly. And then ultimately, the superior position, tactics for, from a superior position, tempo on the night, take it, transition again. Don't get fixated on your bishop. Beautiful transitions. Finally, a nice tactical idea that he had to find. So, really, it was pretty much perfection. Brilliant game. And then, Winning the Queen of Pawn, another, yeah, I didn't realize that before, but it's a great transitional game, being able to transition from one imbalance or advantage to another. So now we have the extra pawn, we give the pawn up, and we we exchange, we, we, we shift from a Queen and Pawn end game to a King and Pawn end game, which is obviously winning. And then, and then, yeah, as I said, don't play a six act. I mean, maybe it works, we have to calculate, but no, we don't want to mess with it. In this case, my bad. In this case, yes, you take, and then you can toss away your pawn, typical theory, decoy pawn, easiest way. Okay, cool. Yeah, a lot of great, great stuff. I love that. Both games are great. This game actually has very clear narrative throughout the game. It's really brilliant. Okay, cool. Hopefully again, something from it.